today I'm going to be talking about uh, various magnetic field type fun things that occur in planetary and stellar cores. And of course, I can't start a talk with uh, magnetic fields without explaining where they all appear because everybody has encountered a magnetic field in their life at some point, whether they knew it or not. You have them appearing in fun things like VHS tapes and floppy disks to speakers. Um, chemistry labs use them to stir solutions with magnetic stir bars. And even World War II torpedoes were plagued with problems because the torpedoes detected magnetic fields of the ship in order to explode. But those torpedoes were tested in particular parts of the Atlantic Ocean and deployed in other parts of the ocean. And the Earth's magnetic field actually varies wherever you look on the surface of the globe. And so um, what I'm showing here is a plot of if you were to take your magnetic compass and compare magnetic north to true north, how far off are you going to be? And so those torpedoes were deployed in a particular part of the ocean where the declination was far different than where they were tested. This also, this feature of the Earth's magnetic field also has important implications for navigating, especially in a maritime environment. And one of the fun stories involving maritime navigation was of Captain John Phillips, where he was sailing uh, pretty close to the international dateline and the equator right at that intersection. And he was doing this on midnight of New Year's Eve. And he decided to park his boat right on that intersection and continuously ask his navigator for a position where, where are we in the world? And he was simultaneously in two different hemispheres as a result, two different seasons, two different days, two different months. And just because it happened to be New Year's Eve, also two different centuries. And he also probably also led to a little bit of a mutiny because asking his navigator all of these questions and getting different results. So when we look further away from Earth, we can see magnetic fields appear on every planet in the solar system. Not all of the planets have an internally generated magnetic field, but they all have a field nonetheless. Mercury has a fairly substantial uh, magnetic field for its size, but it's mainly just a big old bar magnet. Jupiter has the largest magnetic field that you can even see the aurora caused by the magnetic field lines of Jupiter. And once you get further out into the um, gas giants, Uranus and Neptune, you start to see a really weird um morphology of these fields so you get a very highly multipolar field vastly different from what you see on jupiter or even here on earth here on earth we have a very strongly dipolar uh, magnetic field that's well aligned with the rotation axis and evidence suggests that the magnetic field goes back roughly 4.2 billion years, whereas the Earth itself is about four and a half billion years. So it's been, been around for quite some time. And the Earth is one of only two bodies in the solar system that undergoes magnetic polarity reversals, the other being the sun. But what makes Earth slightly more unique is that these polarity reversals happen pretty much whenever they want to. And so currently, the northern hemisphere of the Earth is actually a south magnetic pole. And that would be indicated by these black lines or black um, entries in this figure on the right. And as you go back further in history, at some point that field flipped and the northern hemisphere became a north magnetic pole. And so these, um, these reversals happen pretty much whenever they want and they hang around for an extended period of time as well. Stars, of course, are also quite magnetically active. And as a result of that activity, they have many stellar flares and coronal mass ejections where they spit off a lot of high energy and high radiation, or high energy particles. And those charged particles, if they hit the surface of the Earth, for example, they can cause quite a bit of damage to things like um, electrical lines and communication satellites and things like that. And so the magnetic field tries to absorb some of that energy and thus protects the planet. 
And so magnetic fields are quite important for any kind of civilization on here on Earth. So how are these magnetic fields actually generated? Um, so if we start with a weak existing magnetic uh, field in the background, and we have some collection of electric charges that are allowed to move through a conductor, those moving charges, which are a current, will induce a magnetic field. And if that induced magnetic field uh, is constructive in a way, so it adds to increase the background magnetic field, then you're growing that magnetic field and that can act on more charges through the Lorentz force, creating a larger current, inducing more magnetic field. And so you get this feedback loop, this positive feedback loop where you're continuously increasing the magnetic field. And you're ultimately just converting kinetic energy of the charged particles into magnetic energy. So it's a giant conversion process. And this is not a new idea. This was actually first done when the field of electricity and magnetism was in its infancy back in the 1860s. But that idea of a dynamo was not applied to stellar and planetary type systems until shortly after World War I. So how does this work in an actual setting? Planets and stars actually form in a quite similar way. You start with a giant cloud of gas and dust. And once you get enough mass collected, that cloud is gonna collapse under its own gravity. As that collapse continues, the core is going to compress and heat up. And it's going to generate a plasma where you have ionized particles hanging around. And of course, any kind of rotation that existed in this cloud before the collapse happened will just get amplified during the collapse due to angular momentum conservation. This is the exact same process that happens when a figure skater starts to spin and they pull their arms in closer, they start to spin a lot faster. And so it's that rotation that allows that plasma to move. So now you have charged particles moving around, that's going to create a current and therefore a magnetic field. And one of the cool things is that we can actually observe some of these uh, happening out in nature. So on the right is a picture of a protoplanetary disk. So right at the center of that is going to be a new star and the spiral arms are where the planets are going to form eventually. In terms of observations, what do we see in terms of these dynamos? And we really only have extensive data on three bodies in the solar system, Earth, Jupiter, and the Sun. I'm only showing Earth and Jupiter here. And on the right, there is a power spectrum. So how much energy is stored in the magnetic field at a given spatial scale. So the harmonic degree, you can think of that as a spatial frequency where low numbers indicate very large scales and high numbers are very small scale features. Both Jupiter and the Earth have a very large dipole component, so we would call them dipolar fields. Jupiter only goes out to about a harmonic degree of about 10. Earth only goes out to 13. And I should say that we can measure Earth's magnetic field out to far larger than 13, but only up to L13 can we take that magnetic field measurement and attribute it to magnetic field that is generated by the interior core of the Earth versus crustal anomalies. And that would be things like a giant hunk of iron that's hanging out in the crust. If you were to measure from a satellite what the magnetic field distribution looks like beyond a harmonic degree of 13, you wouldn't be able to tell if that magnetic field originated from a crustal anomaly or from the Earth's dynamo. And so this is kind of very limiting in terms of what we know about the Earth's interior magnetic field that's generated by the dynamo process. And so this spatial frequency of 13 actually corresponds to about 2,900 kilometers. To put that into, into perspective, that's about the distance between Boston and Denver, so about two thirds of the United States. There's a lot going on in those two thirds and so we really don't know the fine scale structure of Earth's magnetic 
field that is internally generated. And this is where models can really come into play. And so to model these systems, we think about a lot of conservation equations. There's conservation of mass, which gives us one equation. There's conservation of energy that handles how heat is transferred throughout the system. And then there's conservation of momentum. This is Newton's second law, F equals MA, applied to a fluid. And this is where we add effects like rotation, gravity, magnetic fields, frictional forces, things like this. And of course, we're talking about magnetic fields that are dynamic, and so we need to evolve this magnetic field in time. This is a pretty complex system of nonlinear partial differential equations. And as a result, there are quite a few knobs that we get to turn, things like how viscous is the fluid, what's the thermal diffusivity, what's the magnetic diffusivity, rotation rates, size of the domain, things like this. So one of the first things that we try and do is actually non-dimensionalize our system. And non-dimensional numbers are pretty powerful in that they can actually reduce the number of available knobs that you have to turn. In our case, it reduces it down to only a few. And the other nice thing about non-dimensional numbers is that it immediately easily characterizes your system. For example, if I told you Earth, Earth rotates once a day, that's about 10 to the minus three revolutions per minute. You can't immediately tell me whether or not that is slow or fast until you compare it to something that you know, something like the um, how fast your car engine moves or if you wanna take um, the length of this seminar, for example, 45 minutes. At the second you make that comparison, you have built a non-dimensional number and characterized the Earth. The three numbers that I will talk about in this work are the magnetic Prandtl number, the Rayleigh number, and the Ekman number. The Rayleigh number really just tells you how vigorous is the convection in the system. And the Ekman number, um, you can think of that as a non-dimensional rotation rate. So smaller Ekman numbers means a very fast rotation. So with these simulations, ideally you would say, what are these non-dimensional parameters for my system? And immediately plug it into your simulation and go on your merry way. However, the parameters that we get for something like the earth and the sun are quite extreme to what is available to simulations right now. So what I'm showing, under that simulations column is what is available to current global direct numerical simulations. The reason behind this is that computers work on a discrete grid of points. They're not continuous. And so this convection happens on a scale, a length scale that goes like Ekman to the one third. So if you were to decrease the Ekman number, the convective spatial scale would also decrease. And in order to resolve that feature, you would need more spatial resolution, more grid points. Another issue with time stepping your equations forward is that in order for numerical stability, you don't want your solution to blow up and go to infinities. You need to be able to resolve the fastest signal in your system. And so that means using time steps of on the order of about a tenth that of the Ekman number. And so if you're trying to simulate, say, 15 billion years, then that would require something like a trillion time steps or even more. Um, and of course, that depends on your non-dimensionalizations and the sizes of your time steps and things like that. But the smaller your time step, the more steps you need to take. Each step is quite computationally intensive. And so this becomes a very limiting factor. To show this in a slightly different way, um, this figure was, was made seven years ago, but these boundaries are still pretty much pretty accurate. And so down here in this bottom right corner, we see direct numerical simulations and even laboratory experiments. They can't go very turbulent or very fast rotating. Whereas the core of the earth is way up here in this top left corner. So we have quite a, quite a ways to go before we can connect 
results from one corner to results in another corner. <clears throat> and that's actually quite a big hurdle. And so how do we um, connect all our simulations to the core? I'm gonna touch on that a little bit later. And so in terms of looking at what is actually happening in the core of the earth, we can't actually directly measure anything in the core of the earth, such as forces. And so the sizes of these forces is actually um, quite debated. And so one idea is that there's a four-way tie in the force balances that says it's a balance between the rotation, the Coriolis force, the pressure force, gravity in the buoyancy force, and the magnetic fields. Another idea says that it's actually only a two-way balance where you have Coriolis and pressure duking it out, and the Lorentz force would actually be a weaker effect. And of course, what forces are important at any given time directly influences the dynamics of your system. If you think about a parachuter, before they deploy their parachute, air resistance may or may not be important. And it's those um, dynamics of the system that directly influence what kind of observables you get to see. And so one of those observables that is easiest to observe is actually the dipole magnetic field because it's the largest scale. And so a study from about 2002 did a suite of numerical simulations where in black they plotted the magnetic energy and this would be the total magnetic energy so it includes both small scale features and large scale features and then they also split out the dipolar magnetic energy which i've highlighted here in red and this would be more like the large scale features and there's something weird going on here there's if you look at the total magnetic energy, it continuously grows uh, with the exception of this one little kink. Whereas the dipolar magnetic energy shows this weird saturation right in the middle, this plateau. And so the question becomes, is this saturation actually uh, a robust feature of these rapidly rotating dynamo systems? And what kind of controls this, what, what force balances could be developing in this system? And so the way we do this is that this saturation occurs over a range in Rayleigh numbers. So we have to include multiple different Rayleigh numbers. And it could very well depend on magnetic Prandtl numbers and Ekman numbers. And so we include 39 dynamo simulations that vary in all three parameters, multiple Rayleigh numbers, multiple Prandtl numbers, multiple Ekman numbers. And of course, we can't access the true parameter values of the Earth system that we would like. And so we try and find trends of our parameters and see how those trends could potentially be extrapolated to more extreme parameter values. And I keep talking about large scales and small scales. And so when we talk about um, doing the analysis, it would be quite nice to include some kind of decomposition where we can quantify what we mean by large scale or small scale. <clears throat> and we do that by taking any variable that we have in the system, either the magnetic field or the velocities, and we decompose that variable into a mean and fluctuations about that mean. And there are many different choices that you can use for that mean. We happen to just use an average over longitude. So when we do this, we get to make some pretty pictures. This is a 3D volume rendering of the radial vol velocity at a particular point in time. So there's no averaging to speak of. This is a fairly moderate Ekman number. So it's a quote unquote slow rotator. And you can see a lot of different features in this picture. There's a lot of structure to the flow. And of course, this is only one field. This is only one component of the velocity. 
This is only at one instant in time, and this is also only one simulation. So you're kind of um, looking through a very, very focused lens at these simulations when you do this. And so one thing that you can do is take a single simulation like this, compute a volume average over the entire domain, and then now you get one number at the end. And so if you remember those 2002 results, we're talking about magnetic energies as a function of Rayleigh number. And they showed an increase in the magnetic energy, a saturation followed by a decrease. So these red circles are the exact same data that we recomputed of that 2002 study. So that was sort of our verification that we're actually seeing the same result. And once we were happy that we were seeing the same result with using their parameters, we could extend their parameters to smaller Ekman numbers and use different magnetic parameter numbers. So in this plot, we're showing the mean magnetic energy, so the energy stored in the large scale magnetic field. And the different symbols indicate different Ekman numbers, different rotation rates. So as you go smaller in Ekman number, you're going further up in energies, but also you're rotating a lot faster. And so these uh, magnetic energies show a saturation for every Ekman number that we included in our study here. And so this is almost definitely a robust feature of rapidly rotating dynamos. We can take a look at um, these results in a slightly different way if we Instead of plotting the total magnetic energy, we instead plot sort of an RMS magnetic field. And we restrict the data to just the data that's in the saturated regime. And we're also going to switch it up and use a different measure of the rotation. Use, and we're going to use the Rossby number, which is just how important is the inertia compared to the Coriolis. You can think of that as a measure of rotation. Smaller Rossby numbers means faster rotation. And the data that we're showing here is this magnetic field as a function of rotation. This is kind of like magnetic activity as a function of rotation. And this data is very well collapsed. There's only a factor of two or so between all of our simulations here. Why did I even try this? Back in the early 2000s, there was a study that looked at a bunch of different stars. And so these are all different stellar types, different types of stars, different ages of stars. And they plotted a proxy for magnetic activity as a function of Rossby number. And if you ignore this diagonal part on the bottom right and only focus on this part, the, the left part of their graph, their data also shows a saturation as a function of Rossby number. So this is telling us that the simulation that we ran and the data that was used in this 2003 study could be dynamically similar in that they show similar force balances. Um, this is not a one-to-one -one comparison. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done to make sure that this is done correctly but it's a promising looking result. So talking about force balances, force balances are just a giant tug of war between all the different features in a simulation and they can occur in different regions. If you think about the polar regions versus the equatorial regions versus boundary layers, and they can be in different directions like gravity has a preferred direction, magnetic fields, not so much. And these force balances can occur on different levels in the dynamic system. And so to explain that a little further, if we think about trying to quantify what is a primary force balance in a system that has multiple different forces, we're gonna try and do something similar to a Taylor expansion. So our zeroth order estimate, we're just gonna take the three strongest forces and we're gonna say buoyancy, is balanced by Coriolis and pressure. But of course, as with the Taylor expansion, this is not exact. There's some discrepancy in this balance. And that discrepancy is going to be balanced 
by another force, a higher order force. In this case, it would be the Lorentz force. And just with a Taylor expansion, um, going out one more order may not be exact. And so the Lorentz force and the discrepancy from the previous force don't exactly match either. So you go down one more step, and this is where everything starts to become quite important. And so this approach really only works if you have forces that are quite large compared to other forces. For example, this zeroth order balance has forces on the order of a thousand, and their discrepancy is about an order of magnitude smaller. If, for example, the Lorentz force was, say, somewhere in the middle, like 500, it would be a little bit harder to do this kind of a decomposition. So we can apply this to our data by taking a particular point in space and saying, what are the forces doing as a function of time? There's no averaging of any kind. It's just the point in space is far removed from any boundary layers or special points in the domain, like the polar regions or the tangent cylinders. And so what you can see is that the Coriolis force drawn in blue and the pressure force drawn in green are almost mirror images of one another, indicating that they, they balance to a pretty good degree, except for some kind of an offset. And that offset is um, presented by that buoyancy force. So if you were to add all three of these forces up, you might get expect something that's fairly close to zero. And so this is what you would consider the primary force balance in the system in this particular direction, the radial direction. If we take all three of those forces, and add them together, just like I said before, that discrepancy in the previous order is exactly matched by the Lorentz force. And so this is sort of the first appearance of the Lorentz force in this direction, indicating that the Lorentz force is quite weak compared to the other forces and therefore a higher order effect. And of course, we can do the exact same thing in the zonal direction, although there aren't as many forces to worry about. And so um, the primary force balance that you get actually does involve the Lorentz force. And so this is the first appearance of the Lorentz force in the primary leading order force balance but it only shows up in a single coordinate direction. And of course, if we do the, the same kind of thing that we did before, where we look at the discrepancy in that force and compare it to everything else, this is where every force becomes important and it's a little bit messier to interpret in terms of this Taylor expansion idea. We can look at this data in a slightly different way where instead of looking at a particular point in time, we take a full domain average, in this case, an RMS volume average of all of these forces. And what you see is these three Coriolis pressure and buoyancy forces still at top of the line, most important forces. And if you compute this thermal wind balance, where you add all three of those forces together and then do your volume average, those, that thermal wind balance lies directly on top of the Lorentz force, which might be a little hard to see in this plot. Uh, but this is just indicating the same thing that those instantaneous plots did before, is that the Lorentz force is a higher order force in the radial direction. And then you get down to this even higher orders where all the other forces become important. And I'll point out also here that the viscous force down at the bottom, it's nice to see that it's on the bottom and that we, we don't have viscously dominated simulations, but there's a definitive trend in the viscous force with Ekman number. And so if you were to extrapolate these results to smaller Ekman numbers, you would expect the viscous force to potentially play a non-negligible role. And of course, we do the exact same thing in the zonal force direction. And we see very similar trends where 
Coriolis and Lorentz force are now the leading order force balances. And every other force in this direction becomes a higher order effect. And so since the Lorentz force is the, or since the Lorentz force only appears in the leading order in this particular direction and is balanced by the Coriolis force, the large scale magnetic force is really balanced by the meridional circulation. So within a given simulation, it's really the meridional circulation that's controlling how large that uh, large scale magnetic field can grow. And we see a similar trend with the viscous force. Whereas as we go to smaller and smaller Ekman numbers, the viscous force plays a more important role or could potentially play a more important role. So I want to come back to this figure um, quickly in that these simulations are quite expensive to run. And so usually um, when you're given time, you have to choose where to use that time. And it's a giant optimization problem. And remember, we're always ultimately trying to extend our results down to a different part of the parameter space. And so there are, generally speaking, a few different ways we can go about doing that. Usually when you get an allocation on a supercomputer, you're given a finite number of computing hours, CPU hours, node hours, something like that. And you can spend those hours running a couple single type simulations where you choose the most accurate or extreme parameters that you can afford, the smallest Ekman number, the highest rating number, or something like that. And you end up using all of your time on a couple simulations. Another approach is to uh, run a full suite of more moderate parameters in a parameter study and see where those trends lead. Um, I'm not going to advocate one over the other. Um, this work that I presented earlier happens to use the parameter study approach. But in either case, you have to use computing time. And so if you can find a way to reduce the amount of time spent computing, you can be much more efficient in your research efforts. You can either save computing time and do more simulations or save computing time and do more intense post-processing steps. Um, either way, you're not spending all of your time just waiting for a simulation to finish. And so moving on to sort of the current development plans for really how are we actually making that happen? The new systems that are coming online, a lot of the supercomputer systems are making use of graphics cards and coprocessor type architectures. The figure on the right here was taken from the top 500 list that was published back in November. And it shows that 30% of those top 500 computers made use of a graphics card of some kind or a coprocessor of some kind, something that's not purely a CPU. And the current way Rayleigh solves these fluid equations to get these dynamo simulations is it computes entirely on the CPU cores and the GPU sits idle. And so if we can make use of that GPU, we would be more efficient in using the actual full node that we have access to. But we can also make use of machines that were built for GPU type computing from the ground up. A lot of systems like the Pleiades system uh, run by NASA has a lot of CPU based nodes and then they have a couple GPU based nodes as GPUs became more popular. Other systems um, like the Department of Energy type machines are building general purpose graphics cards nodes. And the purpose of that machine is to efficiently use your graphics card. So if you want your code to make use of the most diverse set of computers, then it would help to add some capabilities that make use of those graphics cards. The trick, though, is figuring out 
what work to offload to the GPU. In the case of Rayleigh, it's a pseudo spectral code. So we use a lot of physical space and spectral space transforming back and forth. And of course there's a matrix solve to get the next iteration. So those transforms take place one for every coordinate direction. The Fourier transform takes care of the longitude direction. And it's already quite fast because it makes use of the FFT library, specifically the FFTW. Um, and if you're not aware, the FFTW stands for the fastest Fourier transform in the West, which I think is a great name. The radial direction is handled with a Chebyshev transform. And so there's, uh, it can make use of the FFT as well. The slower steps are the Legendre transform, which is a full matrix multiplication and the linear solve. So I'll talk about first the Legendre transform. And in Rayleigh, our data is laid out um, in spectral space, and we'd like to move to physical space. And in spectral space, that means it's a spherical harmonic decomposition. So you specify a spherical harmonic degree L and an azimuthal order M. And to go from spectral space to physical space, you multiply by a bunch of associated Legendre polynomials. The details are not important just the fact that it's a matrix multiplication. That needs to happen at every point in radius for every field, for every real part, for every imaginary part. And so that information is all captured in this number of right-hand sides or number of fields. And this can be easily 5,000 different quantities that need to be transformed. So the full Legendre transform involves many such matrix multiplies. And if you want to try and divide this work, some going to the CPU, some going to the GPU, there are a couple ways you can do it. The first way is by splitting based off of this right-hand size. Essentially, you cut this matrix in half and say the GPU is going to compute the first half of that matrix transform or matrix multiplication. And then the CPU will compute the second half of that matrix multiplication. And you do that split for every M that you need to do. A separate approach would be, instead of splitting based off of this right-hand side, you split off of how many M values are being computed. So you would say, I'm going to send the first 15 M values to the GPU, at which point the GPU would compute this full matrix multiplication, and then the CPU would be left to do the rest of them. In either case, the idea is to have the CPU and the GPU both computing at the exact same time. So you're not wasting time sitting there waiting for the GPU to finish before the CPU continues. They would all be happening concurrently. And this is very much a work in progress, but some preliminary results from the Pleiades um, V100 graphics cards show some quite promising results. And so what I've done here is every data point that you see on this graph is a different um, simulation where I've thrown different amounts of work onto the GPU. And I've only done that, I'm only showing data for the M equals zero mode. So this would be the most extreme matrix multiplication that you would have to do within a particular simulation. And for these smaller resolutions, you see that there's very little gain from sending any amount of work to the GPU because a pure CPU simulation is faster by sometimes a factor of 10, sometimes only a factor of two. Once you get to these higher resolution cases, <clears throat> you start to see a much more significant speed up. This is about a factor of five increase for this highest resolution. And so, like I said, this work is still quite prelim preliminary, but it shows some very promising results in terms of where we would like to be. And I should say, in these intermediate cases, when we're sending part of the work to the GPU, this is happening concurrently where you're doing a matrix transform on the CPU at the exact same time 
the GPU is doing its work. So another way that we would like to improve Rayleigh is of course speeding up some of the math kernels, but also removing some of the work that you need to do in general. So a lot of convection-based simulations require reaching some kind of equilibration phase or equilibrated phase. And so you spend a lot of time, a lot of computing time, computing the linear phase or the initialization phase before you get to the quote unquote fun part of the simulation. And this is where you would take a lot of time averages, volume averages, and compute your meaningful statistics. Achieving this equilibrated state is quite time consuming and re requires a lot of um, computing time. If you could cherry pick somebody else's results and restart their simulation using whatever parameters you want, then you can short circuit that and immediately start right off the bat. And so this is what the Rayleigh simulation library is meant to help you do. And so the simulation library is a centralized web accessible uh, repository of checkpoint data. So you can go to the website, look around to see what kind of simulations exist, and then pull down that checkpoint data and restart your simulation. And this is all hosted by the Open Science Framework, um, which is a, a free service. You can host your own data up there. Um, and if you have a nice library or catalog of checkpoint data, you can even store um, output data if you would like. This would make doing parameter studies a little bit easier where you can go pluck a checkpoint where somebody has already run the parameters that you want to include. And so you can save all kinds of compute time by not having to compute that initialization phase. And a lot of the time you can avoid re-equilibrating or verifying published results too, if somebody has uploaded their data. And I think one of the biggest aspects of this simulation library is that a lot of the work in high resolution computational models is not re reproducible in a practical way. So if somebody spends a million CPU hours computing a really nice result, and you want to reproduce or verify those results, you have to burn a million CPU hours of your own or use those CPU hours to do your own science. And so a lot of results go unreproduced for that reason. So in the dynamos that we're seeing, a lot of the large and small scale magnetic fields show different behaviors and the saturation of the large scale indicates a, a nice dynamic similarity with some observations, indicating that these results and actual stars could be dynamically similar with a similar force balance. And that force balance being a semi-magnetostrophic balance where the Lorentz force only enters into it in a particular direction at the leading order. And then on the software side, GPUs are becoming more and more prevalent with newer machines coming online. And uh, they're also becoming quite efficient in their computational powers. And so we should be able to make use of them. And along that same note, the Rayleigh Simulation Library is going to be a great resource moving forward for circumventing burning hours into generating your own results. And I'll also say, if you would like any more information on the force balances and the asymptotic um, forces arguments, um, these two papers go into much more detail than I was able to hear. So with that, I will stop and take any questions if you have them. Okay. Is there no question? Can I ask? Sorry, I sorry, I I apologize. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, I have a question about the force balance. So, so you saw a you you shown a force balance in a zonal direction zonal direction of the phi component. Yes. Is it a force balance in a zon zonal mean of the force balance? So those those force balances are in the the longitudinal direction. Yes. And they're all mean forces. So we've mean then we've so the averaged average. we've averaged the force in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of wonder. So, yeah, so now if we take the average, yeah, sure, it's on a pressure gradient vanishes. And uh, yes, yeah, so no five component. There's no five component in the uh, branch. Then yeah, so the uh, yeah, rest is the advection, uh, Coriolis force and the uh, Lorentz force. Eh? Yes. Little bit wondering. So uh, can we say it's a can we say the the force balance between Coriolis and Lorentz uh, primarily force balance because on uh, I afraid, I'm afraid the so, uh, amplitude is much lower than the. Uh, uh non zonal mean component non action non axiometric component yes the zonal forces are much smaller than the radial forces yeah and even the the theta forces the co-latitudinal direction um and so it's still on the same order that's the funny thing um the the two papers listed there go into a lot of details about those scaling relations in particular um, and deriving that scaling relation and so yes it is a um we would argue that it is still a primary force balance mm. although nothing says that the those forces need to have the same magnitude in different directions to be considered primary balances okay Oh, thanks. Yes, good. Yeah, I'm keep thinking. I'm keep. Yeah, I'm keeping. Keep thinking if we can do say it. <laughs> thanks. No one has a question. Then can I? Can I also ask again about the GPU stuff? <laughs> Ryan, go, go ahead, Jira. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you shown a good result on a GP, but so the, is it the, you see how many, how many nodes do you use for the, this test? So these GPU tests are, I guess what you would consider serial in that there is yeah. no MPI involved at all. Okay, then, and then so how many radial, radial uh, gr uh, not grid, uh, uh, radial grid are there, no? Radial. Uh, it would have been LMAX plus one over two. So for the LMAX 511 case would have had 256, and the LMAX 255 would have had 128 grid points in the radial direction. Okay, you you also changed the number of the radial grid, no? That I didn't play with too much. Um, now, the, the radial direction doesn't terribly impact the Legendre transform yeah the larger issue is the number of theta grid points of course you're transforming more things with more yeah. radial grid points but yes okay thanks and uh, yeah probably last probably my last question from the gpu is on this yeah you shown a gpu has better performance with a more than uh, L max equal 512. Yep. Does it fit in the uh, actual in the productive line? So the, I, I wonder so in the productive line, so the, yes, on the each node does have the whole 512 in mode, no? 5, 512 degrees. No? Right. What I'm showing is an absolute worst case scenario. And so a lot of the GPUs are going to have on the order of five to 10 or even more gigabytes of memory. So they can store pretty big quantities. Okay. Um, 
Right, but I, I have not done the MPI aspect, so this is not a distributed type problem as of yet. All right, thanks.